to get a successful profile from those degraded samples is a challenging uh, exercise. So now we are looking at uh, uh, different technologies like single nucleotide polymorphisms to help in human identification. Single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs are the most common genetic variations found between two individuals. Here, there may be a difference of just one nucleotide in a specific stretch of DNA. This single nucleotide variation can help link an individual to a sample, even if the available DNA is very less in amount. But DNA technologies don't just solve headline-making cases. They can also bring comfort to families grappling with crippling diseases. For many families afflicted by genetic disorders, like physical and mental developmental issues, heart disease or cancers, etc., DNA fingerprinting can help cope with the situation and plan for the future. All these genetic disorders can occur throughout right from birth of the child to an adult and whenever they have a problem, either they consult us directly or they are referred to us by a physician. So then we examine them and we decide what test needs to be done. And then these genetic tests help us to identify the reason. We can counsel the family and if they wish to have one more child, obviously the parents are worried. Will that child also have this error? Will that child also have this disease? How will we be able to cope with it? So before a child is born, uh, when, uh, when the mother is pregnant, we are able to do certain tests to ensure or to check whether the unborn fetus, the unborn child has that error or not. And if that error is there, then the parents can be counseled, would they like to have the child or uh, undergo an abortion? So a therapeutic abortion as it is. A single molecule of DNA, a myriad of complex cases. As a life-giving molecule for all things in nature, its purpose is much bigger than just human dilemmas. And so scientists at CDFD turn to DNA to safeguard one of India's signature products, Basmati rice. This fragrant, flavorsome and elegant grain is a celebrity in the rice kingdom. Only grown in this part of the world and highly sought after by many, Basmati exports are often victim of a terrible crime, adulteration. Luckily. DNA detectives are there on the scene. We identified some of the DNA markers which were specific to basmati rice. Using these specific uh, markers, we can actually uh, detect non-basmati rice in the basmati rice samples. So adulteration level detection can be as precise as uh, 1 to 3 percent level. When we presented this protocol, and also we publish these protocols and we also have a patent on this protocol. Most recently, DNA fingerprinting has moved on from protecting flora to protecting fauna. Conservation groups around the world and in India are increasingly turning to DNA to fight crimes like poaching and illegal trafficking of endangered species. The wonder molecule of DNA is not just an accurate detective, but also a versatile one. Now the question is what is going to be the future technology? Now latest uh, development which is taking place from a genomics to phenomics. You have a DNA scene of crime. Can you sequence the DNA and uh, make the picture of the criminal who has committed the crime? So you don't have to go anywhere. The DNA can tell you the whole story. Nearly 30 years after first being used in forensics, DNA technology in India has come a long way. It has cast its lens beyond sensational court cases to encompass a higher goal. 20 years ago when the technology was first introduced, there would be questions in court uh, discussing, particularly from the defense lawyers, discussing is this technique valid enough, is it accurate enough, those questions no longer apply. Future of the technology I would say is really in expanding its use within India. With a very conservative estimate, we are doing less than 1% of cases 
that needs to be done right and i think our uh, our goal will really be to expand with these challenges to meet dna detectives forge ahead with renewed vigor in the coming years they hope to tackle a far wider variety of complex mysteries thanks to the double helix many more case files will then be conclusively closed if you'd like to share your feedback on today's program please send your suggestions and comments to vigyan prasar c24 kutub institutional area new delhi 110016 or you can mail us at info at vigyanprasar.gov.in Welcome to In Depth. I'm Tina Jha. Rapid population growth and urbanization has multiplied the demand for energy worldwide. Electricity demand, in fact, is increasing about twice as fast as overall energy use. In the coming decades, the world will need a lot of energy, especially clean energy. To answer this demand, the world's best scientists are trying to create what they are calling a miniature sun on Earth. This is a plasma-based fusion reactor that will cost 25 billion US dollars. Called the ITER project, it will be the costliest mega science project on Earth in the 21st century. India is one of the seven partners in this global collaboration. We've already committed about 17,500 crore rupees. In fact, during his recent trip to France, Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited the ITER facility, where he commended the joint partnership in the international thermonuclear experimental reactors. Today in In-Depth, we tell you all about the ITER project, India's contribution to this global collaboration and the progress it has made so far. Besides, we also look at the need for nuclear energy and the challenges posed by fusion power. For centuries, people have been trying to harness the energy of the sun. And now, scientists are working on a unique way to generate solar energy without the sun, by building a miniature sun. India is playing a key role in the project that is underway in France by committing over 17,500 crore rupees to the project and also providing the world's largest refrigerator to house the reactor. The best Indian scientific brains are also working on the ambitious ITER project. Sun, the primary source of energy for Earth, regarded as a deity in many cultures for the vital role it plays in sustaining life on our planet. For centuries, people have been trying to harness solar energy in different forms, primarily for heating and light. Today, solar energy has become the need of the hour in our aim to achieve sustainable development. And scientists have started looking beyond our natural star to generate solar energy. The world's best scientific minds are at work to create a miniature sun on Earth to tap its fusion energy. Termed the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactors, the mega project is underway in southern France at a cost of over 25 billion US dollars. The project is designed to produce 500 megawatts of energy from just 50 megawatts input heating power. 
It aims to achieve this by fusing two heavier atoms of hydrogen to produce unlimited quantities of energy in a reactor that mimics the sun with temperatures of about 150 million degrees Celsius. This attempt uh, which is happening in uh, France, uh, it, the project is called as ITER, I-T-E-R, uh, uh, generally pronounced as ITER, euphemistically is called as uh, miniature sun or mini sun, uh, where uh, by the process of nuclear fusion, you want to produce energy. So, we will be using uh, deuterium which is uh, the uh, heavy hydrogen for producing it. Heavy hydrogen means that it will have uh, one proton, one neutron, okay, one proton and one neutron. So, you take uh, two deuterium and then combine together, you will get a helium and energy. That is what uh, is uh, being attempted there. That is what euphemistically people call as mini sun. <laughs> contribution to the most expensive and ambitious science project of the 21st century is immense. Being a full partner in this ambitious project since 2005, India has committed about 10% of the cost or about 17,500 crore rupees. A team of over 100 Indian scientists is trying to do what was once unthinkable, trying to tap the sun's real energy source to give the world an unlimited supply of clean energy. India has also contributed one of the biggest components of the project, the world's largest refrigerator that houses this unique reactor. Weighing around 3,800 tons, the refrigerator was made in Gujarat by Larsen and Tubro. On his recent visit to France, Prime Minister Narendra Modi took stock of this mega project. Other than India, ITER is supported by China, the European Union, Japan, Russia, South Korea and the US. These countries together hold 50% of the world's population and account for about 85% of the global GDP. The EU is contributing about 45% of the cost with the other nations contributing approximately 9% each. So now uh, if you look at this ITER project as I told it is a new uh, way of uh, international cooperation in doing science. So what happens here is that every country is assigned some task like uh, India is assigned uh, for example making chirostat which is a uh, way for example to cool the system and some other components. So every country is uh, every country has some laboratory in India for example there is a institute for plasma research in Ahmedabad who is doing the uh, leading work in this uh, field in India. There are also many other uh, institutions which are also part of this. So they are the main uh, agency in India part of the ITER project. So every country does different uh, technology. They are all assembled at uh, ITER. So all the countries, all the scientists who are involved in gets a full know-how. So India's contribution is in uh, this way uh, developing various uh, technologies for the overall ITER project. Apart from money, we are given money also because when Mr. Modi was in Paris recently, he and the French president, they discussed this particular thing. I think 70,000 crore or something has been given to them. That is, you know, apart. But the benefit as you are saying, see when you design a cryostat of that size, 8,000 ton stainless steel cryostat, this is the first time in the world that such a large cryostat is being built or has been built because we have already supplied it. It is a big experience for the industry because LNT, the Indian company, they have manufactured it. In 1988, the ITER project was officially initiated with India becoming a part of ITER in 2005. The construction of the ITER Tokama complex started in 2013. The construction of the facility is expected to be completed in 2025 when commissioning of the reactor can commence. Initial plasma experiments are scheduled to begin in 2025. However, bringing the sun to the earth is not without its challenges, especially managing the massive temperature gradient in the reactor. But with the world's best scientists on the job, once operational, the miniature sun may provide the ultimate solution to all our energy needs, providing an unlimited, green and safe supply of energy for the world. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Being termed as the way to new and carbon-free energy, ITER is the most ambitious energy project in the world today.
Thousands of engineers and scientists from as many as 35 countries have contributed to its design since its inception back in 1985. 66% of the project is completed so far, with operations expected to start in 2035. ITER, or the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, is one of the most ambitious energy projects in the world. Headquartered in the Cadarache area in the south of France, ITER's purpose is to build the world's greatest tokamak. Let's first understand what a tokamak is. It is a magnetic fusion device designed to harness fusion energy based on the same principle that powers the sun and the stars in our universe. Inside a tokamak, the energy produced through the fusion of atoms is absorbed as heat in the walls of the vessel. Just like a conventional power plant, a fusion power plant will use this heat to produce steam and then electricity by way of turbines and generators. The amount of fusion energy a tokamak is capable of producing is a direct result of the number of fusion reactions taking place in its core. More fusion reactions would mean more production of fusion energy. ITER, I-T-E-R, actually means that uh, International Thermonuclear uh, Experimental Reactor. That's the uh, name. So thermonuclear is a technical word, which is actually meaning that uh, nuclear uh, fusion, that where you want to fuse. This uh, experimental station is uh, located in France. It's an international collaboration. So you have European Union. Uh, which means that uh, most of the countries in the Europe are part of it. Then you have India, China, Japan, Russia, USA, there is America and South Korea. These are the international partners. So the international partners build different components and share knowledge. So the idea is that together all these countries will create this new technology and each of them will be able to in future use this technology for their own uh, use and development. First developed by Soviet researchers in the late 1960s, the tokamak has been adopted around the world as the most promising configuration of a magnetic fusion device. ITA will be the world's largest tokamak, twice the size of the largest machine currently in operation with 10 times the plasma chamber volume. ITA is designed specifically to produce 500 megawatts of fusion power. It has its sights set on producing 500 megawatt of power while only consuming 50 megawatt of input for about 8 minutes at a time. If this power were converted into electricity, it could power about 1,50,000 homes using clean energy. To put things into perspective, the world record for fusion power is held by the European Tokamak Jet, which produced 16 megawatt fusion energy in 1997. As an experiment, it will allow to test key science and engineering issues in preparation for fusion power plants that will function continuously. It will also help test tritium, a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, which could be a critical component in developing future power plants. One of the primary goals of ITER operation is to demonstrate the control of the plasma and the fusion reactions with negligible consequences to the environment. See, this uh, instrument where uh, this uh, nuclear reaction is supposed to take place, that is the nuclear fusion is take place, is technically called as tokamak. For example, in uh, a nuclear uh, station, you will call that area where uh, the nuclear energy is being produced as nuclear reactor, right? So in the same way, uh, for example, in a coal power plant, you will call it as a boiler, right? Mm -hmm. So the place where the energy is produced is called as tokamak. That's a technical name. What happens? You take a cylinder, completely empty it, uh, make it into complete vacuum. Vacuum means really, uh, you know, uh, serious vacuum. And then you put uh, deuterium, which is uh, heavy hydrogen, in plasma state. ITER will not do it by itself, because it is only located in France. But if the technology is developed, and if it can be replicated, if this particular experimental reactor succeeds, then maybe the designs will be developed and maybe it will be possible for many countries to generate power using hydrogen as a fuel and thermonuclear reaction instead of nuclear fission. The ITER project is the cooperation of 35 countries represented by seven main members, China, the European Union, 
Japan, South Korea, Russia, India and the United States of America. The seven member nations will share the cost of the project including construction, operation and decommissioning. They will also share the experiment results and any intellectual property generated by the operation phase. The expected cost of ETA is 20 billion US dollars. At 45.6%, Europe is responsible for the largest portion of construction costs. The remainder is shared equally by China, India, Japan, Korea, Russia and the US, which comes out to 9.1% for each country. India's contribution is in the engineering and development of key components including cryostat, cooling water systems, vessel in wall shielding blocks, radio frequency heating sources and diagnostic neutral beam system among others. ITER's construction and assembly of all units will be completed by 2025, a key milestone toward full fusion power by 2035. Bureau Report, Sabha TV. One of the key reasons there is life on Earth is because our planet lies within the sun's habitable zone. This means that it is in the right spot to receive sun's abundant energy, which includes the light and heat, which is essential for chemical reactions. But how exactly does our sun go about producing this energy? Let's understand in our next report. The sun, like all stars, is able to create energy because it's essentially a massive fusion reaction. Scientists believe this began when a huge cloud of gas and particles or a nebula collapsed under the force of its own gravity. This not only created a big ball of light at the center of our solar system, but also triggered a process whereby hydrogen that collected in the center began fusing to create solar energy. The sun is composed mainly of hydrogen gas. It is easier to think of sun as a giant ball of very hot plasma composed of around 75% of hydrogen gas, 25% helium and elements like oxygen, iron, neon, nitrogen and silicon. The process of producing energy starts from the core of the sun. The core is the hottest area. In addition to intense heat, there is a huge amount of pressure at the sun's core. Such is the pressure that an enormous amount of hydrogen atoms fuse together in a process that is known as nuclear fusion. This process converts the hydrogen atoms into helium. Four hydrogen atoms come together for one helium atom. This nuclear fusion releases a massive volume of energy that gets released towards the surface of the sun and beyond. So you make uh, hydrogen into a plasma, heat it up by uh, sending pulses of uh, uh, laser, heat it up. So you heat it up and uh, make two hydrogen atoms to combine. Now there is a big challenge. When you create a plasma, how do you contain it? You have to put it in some vessel, right? So you cannot put it in an ordinary vessel because if you put it in an ordinary vessel, let's say made up of hydrogen, I mean iron or steel or something, this plasma will start interacting with that uh, wall and then uh, it will no longer be uh, uh, in the plasma state and because it's very, very hard, the uh, metal will start melting, right? So you need a container. So you actually create a huge magnet. So literally you are suspending this plasma in uh, space. Okay, you are suspending it in space and you are heating it and you are attempting to make a, a fusion. When they fuse, they produce lot of energy. The idea is that for doing all this, you will also be expending energy. But the energy that is coming out will be multiple times. The fusion reactor is a device to produce electrical power from the energy released in a nuclear fusion reaction. It is also called a fusion power plant or thermonuclear reactor. Nuclear fusion takes place when multiple atoms combine together to form a more massive atom. This atom is slightly smaller in mass than the sum of the masses of the original atoms. That difference in mass is released in the form of energy based on Einstein's formula, with E denoting energy, M for mass and C for the speed of light. 
ITER is trying to replicate this on Earth. In the Sun, massive gravitational forces are creating the conditions for fusion. But on Earth, they are much harder to achieve. Fusion fuel, different isotopes of hydrogen must be heated to extreme temperatures of the order of 50 million degrees Celsius and must be kept stable under intense pressure to allow nuclei to fuse. The aim of the fusion research program is to achieve ignition. This is achieved when enough fusion takes place for the process to become self-sustaining. Once ignition is achieved, there is net energy yield about four times as much as with nuclear fission. See, this is not a sun, it is a misnomer. Actually, you see, what we are talking about is the largest fusion reactor which is being built in France. It is known as the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor or ITER. And India is a major contributor to this particular project. It's a $65 billion project, which is being funded by the European Union. Half of it is being funded by European Union, and the rest half by six countries, China, India, Russia, Korea, Japan, and the United States. But India has played a very important role because it has provided the largest cryostat. Cryostat is a device which is used to keep the entire structure in a very cold condition because see this particular reactor which is being built in France it uses superconducting magnets now superconducting magnets need very low temperature minus 200 even below that and to keep the whole thing in that temperature you need a cryostat so the cryostat, which weighs more than 8,000 tons, has been built in India and has already been supplied to ITER for installation. While fusion power offers the prospect of a clean source of energy, it also presents many scientific and engineering challenges. Fusion success as an energy provider will depend on whether the plants can be built and operated safely enough to make the cost of fusion electricity economically competitive. Safety issues include the likely meltdown of nuclear reactor, harmful effects on human health, and effective disposal of radioactive waste. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Studies show that nuclear energy is a clean source of electricity production. It emits very little carbon and carbon dioxide, which makes it the best possible solution in providing for a sustainable and pollution-free energy to the world in the coming years. The world's population is expected to grow to about 9 billion by 2040, driving global demand for electricity up by almost 45%. Fossil fuels are a fundamentally limited resource and will not be enough to satisfy the growing demand. The world therefore needs clean sources of energy that are emission-free, safe, globally available and economically viable. Renewable sources like wind, solar and hydroelectric power have limitations, which is why nuclear fusion is seen as a sustainable long-term solution. Recent advances have ignited hopes that fusion power can be made feasible. Scientists in China built a fusion reactor that became the first in the world to reach 100 million degrees Celsius. That's nearly seven times hotter than the sun's core where hydrogen atoms begin to fuse into helium. In the UK, there is MAST or the Mega Amp Spherical Tokamak, an alternative fusion project that is making big steps forward and is also focusing on smaller reactors. Tokamak Energy announced recently that its plasma hit 15 million degrees Celsius for the first time. In the United States, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is working with the newly formed Commonwealth Fusion Systems to develop SPA, a donut-shaped tokamak with magnetic fields holding the hot plasma in place. Funded in part by Breakthrough Energy Ventures, a fund led by Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Michael Bloomberg and other billionaires, the team hopes to develop fusion reactors small enough to be built in factories 
and shipped for assembly on site. Spark is expected to start producing energy from nuclear fusion by 2025. The Canadian government also announced in 2018 that it is investing 37.5 million US dollars in general fusion, a company founded in 2002 that focuses on an approach known as magnetized target fusion. The company aims to demonstrate fusion on a commercial scale in the next five years. Look, project as I told you, this is to develop a sustainable system for producing energy through thermonuclear reaction, that is thermonuclear fusion. Because if that succeeds, then it may open up the door to, you know, generate energy by using hydrogen as a fuel and thermonuclear process for generating the energy. So it is only an experimental reactor, as I told you. And we still don't know how far it will succeed. And after it is commissioned, it is tentatively 2035, whether they will really get something out of it or maybe they have to do something more, try out something else that we don't know at this point of time. Fusion power offers the prospect of a clean source of energy, but the major challenge is to build a structure strong enough to contain the plasma, the very high temperature nuclear soup in which the fusion reactions take place under huge pressure. According to energy experts, exhaust systems will have to withstand levels of heat and power. Fusion fuel, different isotopes of hydrogen, must be heated to extreme temperatures and must be kept stable under intense pressure and dense enough for long enough to allow the nuclei to fuse. Robotic maintenance systems will also be needed, as well as systems for breeding, recovering and storing the fuel. Although technological breakthroughs are making huge strides, the challenge of perfecting features like the magnetic field indicate there is a lot of work to be done before it is safe for commercial use. Besides, nuclear fusion technology needs to be also economical. But the fusion we may reach in the next few years will possibly include huge capital costs. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. And that's it from us today in depth. We'll be back same time tomorrow with a detailed analysis on some other subject. In case you missed the television broadcast, you can also watch our program online on YouTube and Twitter, the link for which is given below on your screens. You can also send us your feedback and suggestions about our program. Thank you very much for your time. Hello and welcome to Big Picture. I am Vishal Dahiya and today we will talk about RBI's surplus funds. Now, the Reserve Bank of India has decided to transfer 1.76 lakh crore rupees in dividend and surplus reserve to the government of India. This came after RBI board accepted the recommendations of Bimal Jalan Committee on transfer of excess reserve funds to the government. The total amount to be transferred by RBI to the government includes 1,23,414 crore rupees in surplus for the financial year 2018-19 and 52,637 crore rupees as excess provisions identified according to the revised Economic Capital Framework or ECF. Now, this transfer of record surplus funds from RBI is expected to boost overall revenue for the government and meet its fiscal deficit target. For more on this, we are joined by a distinguished panel of guests. Let me start by introducing them to you, beginning with uh, Professor Aman Amagrawal, the Director of Indian Institute of Finance. We also have with us uh, Mr. Mohammad Halim Khan, former Secretary of uh, Ministry of Finance. And we are also joined by Mr. Ashok Nag, former advisor of RBI from Bengaluru. Let me begin with you, Professor Agarwal, and let's you know uh, put the things in perspective a little bit here. What exactly are we trying to convey when we say that this is the record surplus amount which has been transferred from RBI to the government and the amount also looks uh, very huge, 1.76 lakh crore rupees. So what is RBI surplus fund and why is it so much this time around? Yes, I'm happy you raised this because you see, 
on an average in the last decade or so, anywhere between 40 to 60 uh, thousand crores has been given away to the government as dividends uh, by the RBI. Now, dividends are because the government is the stakeholder in RBI, so there is actually bound to be a dividend which is to be paid out of the earnings which the RBI makes. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is that every year, like every company does, the RBI being the regulator also calibrates as what, the, what are the expected incomes which are expected to be there. Now, the income sources are they have reserves which are we, which we tend to amount to about 430 billion dollars which are kept in overseas uh, markets which are different central banks and all in terms of gold, in terms of uh, SDRs, in terms of other deposits which are kept. So, they are re repatriating certain returns on those deposits as well. Then the bank also gives loan to the commercial banks within the country, whether it is private sector or public sector, mm -hmm. they give loans to them that on a short term basis, they take these funds to meet their capital requirement adequacy ratios and all. So, there are some other means in by which the RBI keeps earnings like this. Now, those earnings 